Today is September 14th, and growing up, for me, September was always a really big month because um, September 14th today is, was my mother's birthday. September 21st, first, is my wedding anniversary. September 23rd is my parents' wedding anniversary. September 25th is my birthday. So September's always been a really big month. And then my mother passed on September 4th. So September became a really big month. And you, you know, I'm sitting here today with this emotion. I'm like, well, it makes sense. September 14th, it's her birthday. And last night, I went to see an incredible movie. And, and how many of you saw The 100 Foot Journey? Yesterday? Yeah. yeah, one mind, we're sharing it. <laughs> I, I didn't know, I kept not remembering the name of the movie. I kept saying, what are we seeing? Oh yeah, 100 foot, what? 200 yard dash, what is it? <laughs> and I could not remember what this movie was. Um, and we sat down and I really, it was a long day and the kids wanted to go and we sat down and oh my God. It started and I didn't stop the waterworks for two hours. It was just, and it was beautiful, tears, but it was like, and I kept turning to Nora going, this is so beautiful. And she didn't have, she was like, it is. And I was like, and I just was like this big emotional ball of like, oh my God, what an incredible journey. So the 100 foot journey, I won't, I won't ruin it for those of you who haven't seen it yet. It, you really, everyone in this room should see that movie. I, I, I defy any of you to go see it and not be emotionally pulled into it. Um, but it, it, it brought a question up for me that I wanted to bring to you today, which is this. How far do you think you have to travel to realize the greatness within you? How far do you think you have to travel? Because I think we think we have to go places and do things and accomplish things to, hey, Connie, can I have water up here? Thanks. Um, if, I could just, if I could just get clear that I don't have to go anywhere special for the greatness. Oh, it was right there, thank you. See that? I don't have to go very far <laughs> to have what is right in front of me. <laughs> I know you think we planned that, we didn't. Um, so I started thinking about that. How far do I have to go to really find my greatness? Do I have to go to church on Sundays? Do I have to be in classes? Do I have to do, do, I have to do workshops? What do I have to do to find my greatness? And all of those things are tools. I love that we come together on Sunday to celebrate and just enjoy one another's company and atmosphere and create a consciousness that takes us to such a high level. But do I really have to do this to really find my greatness? The answer is no if I'm willing to stay tapped into it at all times. When I was a freshman in high school, I remember sitting in homeroom my freshman year, early, in, a, in September, and a little announcement came over the speaker, and it was, um, now, I had not done any theater or anything up to that point, but I know it's shocking to you all, I'm sure, <laughs> that I didn't come out of the womb singing Rose's Turn, but <laughs> I didn't. Uh, freshman year of high school, I was sitting in homeroom and they made this announcement that the girls high school, Nazareth Academy, was going to be holding auditions for the music man on such and such an evening. And I, rem I remember sitting there and thinking to myself, I think I'll try that. I think I'll do that. Sports didn't seem to be in my game plan. I was like, <laughs> clearly, I was like, I think I'll try that. And when I was a freshman in high school, I was only four foot eleven. I was very, very short, much shorter than my children are today. And so there I is, I'm a freshman, four foot, you know, four foot 11, and I go out for, uh, and, and here's the deal. I, I lived in a very Catholic community, and we kind of stayed close to home. Anybody else? You just kind of stayed close to home. We didn't do what my kids do, which we travel. We just came back from Scotland. We travel everywhere. I'd never been on a plane or a bus or, or, a, or, a, or a, a, a train. I just lived in northeast Philadelphia. That was it. So. I remember leaving the house in this white trench coat. You know how you have these things that happen to you and you remember what you looked like even? And I remember leaving in this white trench coat and getting on the bus and going down Frankfurt Avenue in Philadelphia and the bus driver said, we will now be crossing the city line. I was like, oh my God, I didn't know Zazareth Academy was in another country. And I remember sitting on that bus all by myself in this little white trench coat and a, a, a white shirt and a black dickie, remember dickies? And, 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 and little like uh, Oxford shoes with the white and the black and the, quite a picture. And I remember sitting there and then we, I got off the bus in another world, in another county, 
And there was this big college. It was also a college and a pre preparatory high school. And I had to walk down this long driveway. And I walked in, and it was like all girls, just all these girls. And I walked in, and they just swarmed me. Oh my God, a boy is auditioning. It was amazing. <laughs> and I auditioned, and I got cast. And it was a boundary that I crossed all by myself. And I remember my parents didn't even ask me where, where I was going. Back in those days, you're, you got up, remember you'd get up in the morning, you'd go out to play, you'd come home at dinner, yeah. and no one checked on you because they didn't think anybody was kidnapping you or anything? Yeah. It's very different times now. <laughs> you know, our children go out on a bike ride, I'm like, take your cell phone, call me every five minutes. You know, but that's not what it was like then. I remember leaving, nobody even asked me, where are you going in that trench coat? <laughs> I just went. And I remember coming back and my parents hadn't gotten off the couch in the entire three hours it took me to get there and back. And they're still sitting there. And I remember, God, it sucked. It just happened like it happened yesterday. And it wasn't. I remember coming in the door and like going up the stairs to the bedroom and having, hearing, where were you? I was like, I just auditioned. <laughs> this should have been a big clue. I just, I just auditioned for the music man and I think I got it. And they were like, okay. So... <laughs> My father, being, you know, one of the cops in the neighborhood, <laughs> was like, well, this will be big at the cop shop to try to talk about. Um, <laughs> so, so I remember that boundary. I remember going really far to step into my greatness. Because it really was my greatness, and I didn't know it. I had no idea. It came through me, to me, and I just got dressed, got on a bus, and went. And... I think sometimes that's what happens to us if we're willing to be open. We hear, and like the whole thing about the hundred, that's so, I can't tell you the movie, I don't want to ruin it for anybody. The, the, just imagine the hundred foot journey. Sometimes what we are looking for is right here, like that glass of water, is right here. And we think we have to go on this major journey. And yet, it is right here. And the journey is taking right here everywhere you go, and not thinking you're going anywhere to find anything. You're going there to celebrate yourself as wherever you end up. Do you get the difference? I don't need to go to Scotland to find something. I go to Scotland as me, in me, and Scotland becomes me. And that's my experience, because I'm experiencing it. The God that I am is experiencing a God, the part of God I hadn't met yet. That's what this is all about. That's what this whole journey is about. In the movie, there's a line, um, it's a beautiful line, and it says, things break for a reason. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Things break for a reason. I, I, I can't tell you this joke because my son said something so funny after that, but it would ruin the thing for you. This is really difficult to travel. <laughs> to try to tell this story without giving anything away. But anyway, there's a beautiful line and it says, things break for a reason. And it's so true. It's so true. Whatever is in your life that you think is broken or whatever part of you feels broken, there's a reason behind that. And for me, broken just requires an adjustment. Anything that's broken requires an adjustment. You don't have to throw it out. You don't have to think it's irreplaceable or that it's um, unfixable. It just requires an adjustment. Emma Curtis Hopkins said this, if you can redden your face with a thought, you can straighten your cracked bones with a thought. Now think about that. How many of you can redden your face with a thought? I could redden your face right now. Just tell you something that you all blush at, right? It's just you reacting to a thought. So if you can redden your face with a thought, you can straighten your cracked bones with a thought. So, there was that first trip to Nazareth Academy and to, to do Music Man. And fast forward, I was 15, 10 years later, I'm starring as Riff in West Side Story on Broadway. And that wasn't a long time, I'm realizing now, between 15 and 25. With not a lot of training either, I might add. Just a lot of gumption. When I was in West Side Story, to, to really play on, on Emma Curtis Hopkins, during rehearsals of West Side Story, I, I, I told this story many times, so I won't tell you the same story over and over <laughs> until I get older and start not knowing I'm doing that. Um, which is in two weeks. So, 
Um, <laughs> it took me 10 auditions, 11 auditions, the 11th one is what did it, to get the role in West Side Story. Back then, they could audition you for a thousand times before they'd give you the role. Now there are rules. So when I got in West Side Story, it was such a deal to have gotten this role. And I got it on my birthday. On my birthday, remember, that's what gave me the nerve to say to Jerome Robbins, either hire me or I'm never coming back. That was it. And he, I remember his face like, you just said that to me? And I was like, bye-bye. And I left. And then my agent called on my birthday and said, well, they gave you the part finally. Um, but about five weeks into rehearsal, I, in the middle of the cool number, which is maybe one of the hardest choreographed numbers on Broadway ever, I rolled over and snapped my ankle. I mean, snapped my ankle. It was so loud that we could hear it over the band that was playing, our rehearsal band. And Jerome Robbins, who is one of the kindest men on earth, I remember, because I'm, of course, I'm up front doing this step, and I clop over, and he's like, just get off, and pulled me aside, and I just sat there while everybody finished the number. And then we looked down, and my foot, my ankle had already turned black. And it was pretty clear that it was probably broken. And so I went, they took, I went to the hospital, and then they sent me to a doctor, and the doctor said, pretty much, we're gonna have to set it, put pins in it, and you're pretty much done. You're, not, you're, you're done. You're out of West Side Story. And I was like, I didn't know this science then, but I knew who I was then. I've always known who I was. And I remember looking at that doctor and saying, that's not an option. That is not an option. And so, you know, Jerome Robbins heard what had happened, and he said to me, here's the number, call this man, you're gonna go work with him for a week. And it was a man named Armando Zatina, who was Mikhail Baryshnikov's therapist. And so I went to him and he looked at it and he went, mm, not really broken, it's like an inch away from being broken. He said, okay, we can fix it. He said, I'll be back in rehearsals in ten, in, within 10 days. Two very different ideas. Pins and operation, or I'll have you back there in 10 days. Which one do you think I b decided to do? <laughs> and I remember the pain when he was taking the blood out of my leg and pushing it down into my ankle. Never got near my ankle, but everything else, and he was like, and as he spoke to me, very healing man, as he worked with my body, he would say, the body heals itself. We, get, we interfere, that's the problem. He said, so your body right now is, is, is wanting to heal itself, but you're interfering because you're not stepping on it, you're, not, you're so afraid of it. He said, so we have to stop that. So I'm doing plies and, and he's, I never looked back. My ankle has never given me a problem ever. I did the show, I opened the show, I ran the show for a year. This is what can happen. So that's the, thank you. Yes, 35 years ago. So, and I still have it. So that's what Emma Curtis Hopkins which means when she says, if you can redden your face with a thought, you can fix your bo a cracked bone with a thought. The problem is, we don't know that. Reverend Nancy was, she gave me such an intro here. We don't know that. The title of my thought today is, don't let them fool you. Don't let them fool you. And I am talking about conditions. Your conditions, the conditions in your life, which is what Nancy was talking about, the conditions in your life create a mindset inside your mind that then tells the universe how to act. So if you look at conditions and decide that these conditions are real and that they are insurmountable, then that's what they are. If you wake up and start complaining to yourself and saying, my career's over. No one's gonna want me. And meanwhile, two people are trying to get you to come in and give you a job. But you don't know that. Because you're over here, and, and I don't mean to make you an example, but since you brought it up. <laughs> because she's so smart. She got it within hours. All she had to do was turn on her computer and go, I could have had a V8. Instead, right? That's what we're talking about. Don't let them fool you. Don't let your conditions take you to a place. Everything is possible. Anything is possible because everything's possible. And nothing is possible if your mind decides that. Because there are truths, there are truths that are unquestionable, like everything's possible, and then there are your truths, and my truths with a small t, which basically sets the ceiling and the limit to where my life is gonna go. Lewis Carroll said, sometimes I believe as many as six impossible things before breakfast. It's actually the Queen of Hearts that said that. When Alice says, well, that's impossible. And she says, well, you have to start believing in the impossible. So 
When was the last time you faced something impossible and proved it wrong? When's the last time you really started looking at what seems impossible and deciding it's possible? This show that's about to open today at three o'clock has been enormously challenging, if I want to label it that, but I really don't. I label it as enormously expansive. It has expanded me in so many ways, and there are moments, and there were moments throughout this whole process, where I heard the word, that's impossible. And I just wouldn't believe it. I would not believe it. I refused to believe anything was impossible. And here's the thing, when you absolutely refuse to believe anything's impossible, the universe finds a way to make it possible. When you decide it's impossible, you have shut that door. And I didn't, I refused to. And there are still millions of things to do on this show between now and Friday night, which is the critics' performance. And I will. And they keep, keep, I wake up with them in my head. If you did this, maybe that would work. And here's the thing, looking at this whole piece as one big piece seems really difficult. <laughs> but when you just step and say, how about this? How about this? Well, maybe I could do this now. Well, we could do this. How about this? You know what would be really good? We could do this. How about this? How about if we do this? Oh my God, what if we did this? Or I could just be stuck over here, not taking that first step. The journey is not necessarily way out there. The journey is right here. And it takes you where you're going. Christopher Reeve said, so many of our dreams at first seem impossible. Then they seem improbable. And then when we summon the will, they soon become inevitable. If there was ever a man that had the right to say these words, it was him. And I knew Christopher way back when we did um, a show, show called Are We There Yet at Williamstown. And I, his, his fiance at the time, Dana, was playing opposite me. And um, so I got to know Christopher. And he was just the sweetest, nicest guy. And when, here's the thing, when that happened to him, it didn't change him. And when you talk to him, I met him, I saw him again years later when he was in a wheelchair. And same Chris, except that he seemed more wise and he was more giving in terms of having more time. So anything's possible, no matter what condition shows up. And that's a big condition to show up in your life. And we have people that show us that no matter how big the condition, we can look at it and say, you're not gonna fool me. You are not the truth. Like looking at the television and seeing what's going on in the world, that's not the truth. There's a truth that's far greater than that truth. Anthony Robbins said, what we can or cannot do, what we consider possible or impossible, is rarely a function of our true capability. It is more likely a function of our beliefs about who we are. So what's possible for you is intrinsically linked with who you know yourself to be. That's really what it boils down to. Anything's possible when you know that you are the presence of the divine at all times. Everything is possible when you realize you're one with all of that. Bless you. Anything's possible when you know who you are and everything's possible when you realize you are one with all of it. When you forget that, you start thinking you're your conditions. J.K. Rowling's in Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix wrote, anything's possible if you've got enough nerve. So how many of you have enough nerve? You all have nerve? <laughs> you have nerve. <laughs> so what is it when he says nerve? Well, I looked it up, because I was like, what does that mean? Bracing oneself mentally to face a demanding situation. That's when you, you nerve is a verb, okay? Bracing oneself mentally. But how do you brace yourself to face something that might seem impossible? How do you brace yourself? Many people brace themselves with a reactionary brace. They're just bracing themselves for what it's gonna feel like to fail. Alex Robert Holmes was just telling me this story, you know, that, that he was working with someone at one point in his career who always was working on, let's just figure out what we'll do when, if this fails. Uh, could you imagine how much time it would take to direct a play into what you're supposed to be doing? Now let's take the exact amount of time and show you what's gonna happen when it fails. 
If you get a director like that, run for the hills, Don. Run for the hill. <laughs> We're not here to figure out how to handle things when they go wrong. We're here to know who we are. Because guess what? If you know who you are, you'll know how to handle anything. I am beveled. Unbelievable. I know, I was like, I'm still in my choreographic mode. I just bevel every time I stop. When you know who you are, you can handle anything. <laughs> I know. So, it all comes down to you knowing who is facing the situation. Really, that's all it does. We can go through this whole month saying anything's possible. Have you all been doing it every morning when you wake up? Yes. I have. I wake up every morning, it's like, anything's possible. And I don't do it like anything's possible, they could fall off, <laughs> no. It's really, anything's possible. And it's really important to wake up and say to yourselves, anything is possible today, because everything's possible. I don't know what's going to happen, but it's gonna be for my highest good. I don't know how this is gonna work out, but it's gonna unfold perfectly. And even if it unfolds in a way that may make me upset, may not even be what I said I wanted, I still know it's for my highest good, it has unfolded perfectly, now what do I need to know? And never stop, never take the pit stop at starting to whine and complain, no complaining. The minute you hear yourself complaining, just know this, you are not doing anything positive or constructive. You're just not. There's a way of talking about what's going on without complaining. I see this, I see this, yep, I understand this. Now what can I know here? That's not, oh my God, did you see what he did? That's complaining. So, back to the 100 foot journey. Sometimes we're raised, as Nancy said, to be someone or something that while we are more than capable of being that person, it's not who we are. And I have found that in my own life, that I'm being this incredible person in my life. I'm doing exactly what I, I thought I wanted to do, and I'm really good at it, and everybody thinks I'm good at it, and I'm being held up as really good at this, but it's not what I want to do. You know, if I hear a thousand times people saying to me, don't you think you want to go back to acting? Oh my God, no. And I'm good at it. I'm really good at it. Don't you want to go back to singing and dancing and performing? No. And I'm really good at it. But no. So if any of you have something going on in your life where you're being like kind of held up as this thing and everybody loves that you're this thing, but you don't, you have a responsibility to really honor who you are. Anything is possible, but it has to be what's possible for you. It has to be the you you want to be. You know, the best person we can ever be is one who is true to our heart's desires, but the first thing we have to do is know what those desires are. It starts with knowing the desires and the process you learn not to let the conditions fool you into thinking you have to choose something else. If you have a desire and conditions say that looks impossible, don't take the alternative just because of the conditions. Don't honor the conditions that way. Don't give them the power. If you have a desire, a real true desire, I said to my children, I think I said this last week or the other week, I said to my children, if I wanted to be the president of the United States, I could be the president of the United States. And Nora was like, Dad, really? And I was like, seriously, if I wanted to be the president of the, I could be the first gay president of the United States. I could. I, I can't even imagine Kevin as the first lady, but it's another whole story. <laughs> But I meant it, I was like, if I want to be the President of the United States, I said, but, but, and I wish Caressa McElhaney was here, but she's on this amazing journey of her own right now, but it's not what I wanna be. It's not what I wanna be, and sometimes we are caught in between what we really wanna do and what we're doing. It's like people, I love the line in chorus line when Donna McKechnie says, I don't wanna be teaching other people to be doing what I should be doing myself. You know, those that become a teacher because they don't feel they could really succeed at it. I'll teach other people to succeed at it. No, no. It is time for you to really, really understand that anything is possible because everything is possible. You are possible. So I'd like you to take a deep breath and close your eyes for a moment. In this beautiful world where everything is right here, right now, fully available. I want you to know 
that you are infinite possibility. I am infinite possibility. Anything is possible for me. You are the inevitable about to happen. You are the inevitable about to explode. You are poised, you are positioned to do great things because you are the greatness of life. Anything is possible because everything is possible. And if you would repeat after me, for me. Okay, you can open your eyes. This year was I Am Awake. And it's been a great year so far. I can't believe it's already September. It's been a great year so far. And I have been telling myself all year, I am awake, I am awake. Someone last week gave me a beautiful thing that says, I am awake now. I am awake. What am I awake to? Well, this month, we get to be awake to the truth that anything is possible. Anything is possible. Because there is a spiritual principle that says everything is possible. And so I know that as we continue through today, as we continue into this day, as we continue into this week, into our lives, that each and every one of us is on a journey. And it doesn't have to be a million mile, billion mile journey. And it doesn't have to be a hundred foot journey. In fact, the journey is happening right here, inside your mind. And you are a choice. You get to choose. Am I possible? Am I infinite possibility? Do I know who I am at all times? Will I readily Look every condition in the face and let that condition know you are not the truth. Can I really say to myself, nothing can fool me anymore. I know who I am, I know what I am, I know where I am, and I know who I am here to be. And that is the presence of God, enjoying life, enjoying all of life, every aspect of life, my health, my finances, my creative expression, my relationships, enjoying all that life is because I am all that life is, just waiting for me to say, yes, have at me, live me. Anything is possible because I am possible. Namaste.